Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to this live stream replay about eidetic memory. And uh, we're going to have a chat about it and go through some of the myths about eidetic memory, what it is. And there's some powerful, powerful tips that, you know, you can get from this topic without necessarily falling prey to the mythology. So if you're joining the replay of this, hit the thumbs up get subscribed to this channel if you aren't already and uh, we'll go through this uh, in uh, some detail eidetic memory so we get asked a lot about it and it's related in some people's minds to photographic memory which is something that really doesn't uh, exist either at least not in any practical sense but if we were to give it a definition one of the things that we would do to define it is to call it um a way of memorizing information without out using any kind of memory technique, right? Which uh, would essentially be like taking a photograph. Now, one of the problems with uh, with this photographic memory um, concept is that it is a weird metaphor, a metaphor that is not particularly um, a good one because photography is an old, old topic. It's, a, it's, it's an old technology that fades over time and uh, can be crinkled and needs uh, way more uh, care than your memory needs. Your memory is much more flexible and interesting than that. So we want to think about how we can make a better memory uh, metaphor. Um, but uh, one of the things to, to think about is, is it the best and most powerful metaphor that you could be using. And uh, let me know if you're joining us now, uh, where you are in the world and how you're doing and uh, what you think about eidetic memory in the chat. Uh, let me know also that this is audible um, because sometimes people mention that it's not as loud as they would like it to be. So uh, that would be great feedback to have if you're joining us. Um, let me know in the chat if you can hear. All right, so eidetic memory, yeah. So photographic memory, eidetic memory, it's a interesting topic, but it's ultimately when we use the photographic memory topic, it is a a metaphor, a metaphor that is is weak. And then there's a number of other metaphors like movie metaphor and there's theater memory. Uh, and I prefer theater memory for reasons we'll get into today. Uh, Julie's here. Hi, Julie. Thanks uh, for being here. Thanks for saying hello as always. And uh, <laughs> guess what we're drinking from today? The honorary Julie cup. I do not know why for the life of me, the, um, the camera is reversed on Mac products uh, and YouTube products. Weird. But in any case, interesting. <laughs> so, uh, and and actually, maybe maybe there's something to to be dwelled upon with this because, you know, our brains are working in reverse and so forth, and and photographic memory, the parallax situation may not be the best uh, metaphor for that reason as well. <laughs> so yeah, we want to be careful about our metaphors, and so when we think about uh, the eidetic memory meaning and what it means. We want to think, first of all, that it is a, a term, a fancy scientific term. And then we want to think about the other terms that people use to describe it. So, for example, photographic memory. And then we want to think, how true and how real are these terms and how useful are they? So um, when a term like eidetic and photographic memory are used so interchangeably, they're already sort of, uh, you know, weakening themselves by, by uh, being interchangeable in and of themselves. Uh, and then we want to think about this idea that you would be able to memorize information without some sort of technique. And that's kind of what's in the definition of eidetic memory or photographic memory. However, the reality is, is that except for autopilot memory things that we just learn on autopilot, Memory is, is something that happens to us either by virtue of a conscious technique or an external technique in many, many cases. So 
Uh, Carmel is here. Hi, Carmel. Thanks for saying hello. And the sound is good for from North uh, from uh, NSW. I guess that's here in Australia in a small farm. Awesome. Thanks for being here. If you're joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world and how you're doing. I love to uh, get a geographical map going on. But what I'm trying to get at here with the uh, this issue of of uh, you know making sure that we have the best possible metaphors and and having a, a good definition is that we are always always striving to make sure that we're on the right path and external memorization techniques or internal memorization techniques come down to technique so repetition even rote learning whether you're using mnemonics or not is still a memory technique and so whether you as the student consciously use repetition as a memory technique or you go to school and they put you through repetition you're still learning through a technique and that technique is rote or repetition in school or repeated exposure it may be that they have some sort of um means of deciding uh, systematically when they're going to bring back a certain mathematical principle or a grammatical principle or whatever it is they're teaching you. They may have that all programmed out, but it's still a technique. So the idea that eidetic memory or photographic memory is being able to remember things without a technique is already suspect. It's a strange definition to memorize without a technique. Now, there are things that you memorize or you remember without techniques. And so autobiographical memory tends to, to work uh, without any external or internal technique. Although you want to think, too, that, you know, the world is has many repetitions in it. It has many cyclical things that happen. And so things will be remembered without any effort simply because they happen so often. Um, Menage is here from Nottingham. Oh, wow. Well, uh, my uh, family hails from Nottingham, the English part anyway. Parts of the British uh, background that we have. We don't have many, but we do. And Nottingham is a uh, part of it. Um, my great, great, no, my great grandfather comes from Nottingham. So so great to have you here. Uh, so is that making sense? Let me know in the chat if you have any questions about that. But one of the things to realize is that it's it's an idea that you could memorize lots and lots of information without any sort of technique. There's the division between internal technique and external technique. And the world imposes upon us certain things that we're more likely to remember anyway because they're so repetitive. Uh, and then autobiographical memory will happen on autopilot without any technique as such. But in some sense, it doesn't require a technique because it's just going to happen again and again and again. So what would be an example of this? Well, you might have memorized your birthday, for example, as a young person, but uh, you didn't use any special technique to memorize it. It's just that every year your birthday came around and certain pleasure centers went off in the brain and uh, you, you know it got memorized somehow. Or perhaps, if you think about it, maybe you were given some means of memorizing it because your parents helped you memorize it in a certain way. Same thing with uh, something that would be more procedural memory, which would be like tying your shoes. And that may have taken a long time. And parts of it happened on autopilot as such, just through repeated exposure to the operations, repeated uh, observation of how other people are doing it, and uh, and so on. So it's very hard to, 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 to distinguish and differentiate and divide uh, technique from happenstance and circumstance. And then, of course, the brain has all kinds of chemical operations that are going on all the time that uh, are just going to constantly um, maximize your attention when things are relevant and make connections on autopilot. Uh, but is that photographic memory? Well, no, because photographic memory would take a snapshot and then you would be able to scan it in great detail every single area of the of the actual image. And then like a photograph, it would be suspect to decay over time. Uh, and every detail you know, would, would shrink inside of there. So the fantasy about having photographic memory is... It, is, is a bit strange. Um, but let's talk about the origin here briefly of this word eidetic, which uh, comes from um, eidos, which is Greek, and uh, it means seen. 
so that may be the origin of uh, of this idea of of photog photographic memory. But the issue there too is that there's a lot of things that we need to memorize in life that aren't seen. They aren't seen at all. They are uh, perceived conceptually, right? So, for example, uh, the idea that eidos is the origin of the word eidetic. Well, yeah, you see it with your eyes, but you're also perceiving it in your auditory cognition. You are, if you if you take the time to pronounce it, eidos, then you are, you know, putting it through your mouth. Your muscle memory starts to get involved. And all kinds of different things are going on that are not visual whatsoever. And this is a problem with, uh, with the way that we conceive of memory techniques as a, as, a, as a visual kind of thing. This mirror thing is bothering me. I'm going to get rid of this. Take that off of there. Uh, there we go. Um, so this is, a, this is an interesting thing to, th to think about, is that it's not visual. So any visual metaphor is already problematic um uh, from the get-go so that's uh, something that i would consider is the photographic memory image doesn't really help us uh because memory is not visual it's not it's partially visual not completely visual so that's a that's a real issue uh, okay so moving on we've got uh, the whole idea of eidetic imagery which then you know is something that that it, again is problematic given that we don't think of and conceive of memory in purely visual terms. But um, if we uh, think about eidetic memory um, or imagery, rather, where where would where would we begin? Um, we would begin by thinking about you know um, images maybe that disrupt us, which we talked about on a recent. Uh, a recent uh, 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 live stream that we had when we were talking about getting rid of um, thoughts that uh, that get in in our way. Um, so maybe there are intrusive images that come in. Um, but basically what they're talking about is a vivid mental image that's not necessarily derived from actual experience. So there's a, a lot of science behind this, and you can look into... Um, people who have thought about it in the context of biology, in the context of therapy, all kinds of things. Um, but eidetic image seems to have a lot to do with, um, with vision, some sort of vision and some sort of vision that's coming from something that you haven't actually experienced. Um, Shock is here from Brazil. Hi, Shock. Thanks for saying hello. Uh, if you're just joining us, hit that thumbs up. Let me know in the chat where you're from and uh, where you're at and any questions you have about memory. This is a rather technical topic in some sense, but an important one uh, because there's a lot of people who ask about eidetic uh, memory and so forth. So I want to dive deep into it. Um, so yeah, this idea that eidetic imagery comes from is imagery based on things that you haven't experienced and then it can be a source of new thoughts and new feelings new perhaps new paths of action that you take in life um, which is very interesting to think about uh, and it's uh, something that is tend to tends to be considered very very vivid so uh, you know, I'm trying to think in my own experience where I would have had visions like this as such, but I personally am low on the visual threshold, but some of the things, uh, in various meditations that I've had where you, you feel like you're seeing some sort of light and that light may strobe a little bit. So maybe that's an eidetic image and so forth. But at the end of the day, it's, um, related to dream imagery as well, and perhaps spontaneous uh, images that may come while you're while you're fantasizing about something and you'd I mean I would challenge you to just think about your own experience where have you and how have you had experiences of imagery uh, that you could either see very strongly in your mind's eye or maybe you have had these experiences where you see things in the environment that you thought were maybe a stranger like I've had experiences where I've seen a stranger uh, leaning against a post or whatever, and then you get closer and there's actually no one there. 
right? So if you've ever had the, that kind of experience, um, you know that it's, you're sure you saw something, but then it's gone, right? And it wasn't there at all. So that can be a kind of experience you might want to think about. Um, so, and you know, it doesn't mean you 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 are schizophrenic or anything like that, but it can happen, and it and it has happened. Um, so there's various illusions like that, and then there's the question of whether an eidetic image is different than a memory image. So inside of memory imagery uh, or mental imagery, there's a lot to consider. Um, and so memory imagery, again, as I spoke about, does not necessarily have to do with actual seeing pictures in your mind, but it's feelings, other senses that uh, are very distinct from daydreaming, which can be very thin and substanceless that doesn't have imagery at all, or it could be totally imagistic based. And so something to consider, consider about. But the important thing is that an eidetic image would be distinct from uh, from a hallucination. It would, again, it wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily have anything to do with a mental illness or anything like that. And some people say that, that it's distinct from thought. So, um, the image may be sort of spatial in some sense. It may have a sequence, but it's not necessarily, it doesn't really have the content of thought. So you may consider, uh, some interesting things like they have in the memory championships where you would memorize abstract imagery and then you'd have to connect these uh, abstract images with uh, actual things that are episodic or related to your episodic memory in order to have any chance of having these things that really have no thought connect with um, your mind, what you already know, the stories you already know, the images you already know, the feelings you already know, in order to be able to get back what those abstract shapes were or identify them later. So that's uh, quite interesting. All right, so that's a eidetic image, which is quite fascinating to, to think about. And uh, then another thing that people ask about is, can you, you know, test your eidetic memory? And uh, one of the things to consider there is uh, is going ahead and searching eidetic memory test and seeing what you find on the internet to see how it can be tested. Now, I think that one story that I have where something like this was tested is I tried to... Um, well, I didn't try, but I, I applied to be a security guard, uh, well, not a security guard, but a customs officer. And that came about because while I was in university, I had a, a roommate who worked for the airport and somehow, um, it was, uh, I was going to go, go and do this. And one of the tests that they had there that was really fascinating is they showed a drawing of an airport, uh, airport area where you wait for the plane and they had plants there and they had all kinds of seating there and they had uh, they had uh, everything under the sun that you can manage just like packed with details and then they asked you a bunch of questions about those and so it's not that they're testing your eidetic memory so much or testing your photographic memory but they are um, they're making a, a test of your observation so i think that one of the things to think about is not so much can you test eidetic memory or can you test photographic memory, but can you test your powers of observation? And then the question that one would ask about one's visual observation memory is, what does it work for? So a lot of these tests on photographic memory that you find on the internet, they'll show you an image of like dots and the dots will be um, 60 blue dots and then there'll be maybe seven or eight red dots. And then it'll ask you, you know, how many dots did you see that were blue or red or whatever? And you, you know, can test whether you can actually visually track back how many were there. Now, the question you got to ask yourself is, okay, like, let's imagine that you actually got a good score there. Well, so what? How does that translate into, into real life, into memory skills that are actually going to reflect what you can do in real life? The... I can't really think of anything. The only parallel where that skill I can I can imagine would have any uh, value in in quote unquote real life would be, for instance, if you were a guitar player and you were trying to track what scale someone was or where they were going on the guitar. Maybe you know, but other than that, I can't uh, imagine how that would be. Oh, Joey's here. 
Joey, good to see you. A long time family member of the Magnetic Memory Method crew. Always good to see you and uh, have you on a live stream is even better. Thanks for saying hello. Uh, but yeah, that's one thing. Uh, Another way that they'll do this, and I don't know why they would call this photographic memory or eidetic memory in a, in a test, is they'll they'll also have dots, and they will uh, they will ask you to see what you might perceive inside of there, almost like a Rorschach test, and so that's kind of interesting. But uh, it's uh, it's kind of hard for me to figure out how that that would test that you have eidetic memory uh, or not. Uh, it seems to be a viral thing on the internet that people uh, enjoy playing around with, but not necessarily fruitful for actually determining anything. Um, so, uh, but one of the things that we know is there's uh, some great reports uh, that tell us that photographic, um, even people who score well on these tests, their memory is still far from eidetic. It's far from photographic because ultimately this doesn't exist. There is no such thing as photographic memory. Uh, the memory is more theatrical, which is what we'll get to uh, uh, while we're in this live stream, because that ultimately I think is the most powerful metaphor for the memory, if you need a metaphor. So uh, Fahad is here. Hi, Fahad. Thank you for your uh, review of the Enhanced German ebook the other day. That was great. Uh, great to hear of your results with the uh, magnetic memory method for uh, for German. Uh, wunderschön, wunderbar. We were doing another live stream in the Branding You Academy, uh, and uh, it was awesome. <laughs> One of our members there, Chantal, she just started ripping out German, and and uh, that was amazing <laughs> to get to speak a little German today. So very cool. Um, great. So yeah, keep in mind that, that there, th these tests are there. You can go and play around with them. There's nothing, nothing, no harm done doing that, but what are they really testing? They're, they're testing observation above all. And there's, uh, the actual scientific literature, if you look at it shows again and again and again, that they're not any kind of evidence or proof or demonstration that any such thing, even remotely like uh, photographic memory exists. And they're far from photographic. And if anything, they may, and this is, this is related to hyperthemesia, which we'll talk about in a minute. They may reveal, the people who are very, very good at these tests, what they may reveal is that they're actually obsessively studying the material. Maricella's here. Hello, Maricella. Oh, great photo photographic icon there. Thanks for sharing that. I uh, really appreciate that. Good to see you again. You were on our previous live stream where we got to speak a bit of German. Uh, so that's great that you're in both communities. Um, so yeah, uh, this obsessive nature of things may be part of why some people are better at this. It's not just that they're very good at observing, but they're especially good at observing. And now this observation is uh, from someone named Barry Gordon, who was in uh, Scientific American writing about this. And he says that uh, even visual memories that seem to approach the photographic ideal are far from truly photographic. These memories seem to result from a combination of innate abilities combined with zealous study and familiarity with the material, such as the Bible or fine art. So that's interesting that he mentions and he relates these dot pattern studies to people who are really interested in good at remembering the Bible or remembering art and so forth. And that's very interesting because humans are very good at pattern recognition, for example. And this comes back to what I was saying earlier about autobiographical memory potentially just happening on autopilot and yet still having some sort of externally opposed, imposed rather, structure where you're just getting repetition anyway. So it's not so much a technique, but it's nature following the techniques that we use in terms of rote in order to get things into life. And so if you're really interested in something, it's not so much that you have an extra good memory for it. You're just paying so much more attention to it and things are connecting and you may bring a level of obsession to it. And this is where I want to go with hyperthemesia because hyperthemesia is a really interesting phenomenon. And there was a documentary recently that took my thinking about it into a, into a different direction, but, uh, 
first, let's uh, check in with the chat here. Cyaneum says, memory seems like an image made of fog, low resolution, and the water particles are only just forming the image with an overlay of slight color. That's amazing. I love that. Yeah, there's a lot to the uh, slow res or low resolution, high resolution. I'm reading Maps of Meaning right now by Jordan Peterson, and he talks a lot about memory in Maps of Meaning, and he uses the low resolution, high resolution um, idea quite a bit. And uh, that reminds me that, uh, you know, that's a magnif magnification uh, in some sense. And so when we're using memory techniques, it's not just that we're using a memory palace and then magnifying in on our memory palaces, but also getting really uh, a high a high resolution on those images if we use that language in order to avoid the low resolution of fogginess in the memory. So um, that reminds me that this week's episode of the podcast is uh, all about the Sherlock Holmes myth. And so I'm going to share that link with you here in the chat so you can uh, save it for later before we dive into talking about um, Artemisia. Uh, but yeah, the interesting thing about this high resolution, low resolution, it, it's a great that you're going that way. And I, I'm going to, in the near future, be talking about more about maps of meaning and, and how it talks about memory and the low resolution, high resolution uh, concept because that's an, another great way of thinking about what we're doing. We're really narrowing in and focusing, and this is a better definition than photographic memory. Like it's much more powerful uh, and, it, and it works inside of that realm, but I think it works even better than any camera metaphors, especially because it helps connect us with computer sort of thinking. Now, thank you very much uh, for for that, though, Cyan Yam. That, what a great, uh, great thing, like the fog metaphor, because people do have brain fog struggles and whatnot, which really sucks. And one of the ways that you get over that is by understanding that you can focus on memory palaces and make each individual station in your memory palace very, very high resolution and make the imagery there high resolution so that it cuts through that fog very, very quickly and powerfully. And so um, if you're joining us, hit that thumbs up. Let me know in the chat where you're from. And if you have thoughts about this, uh, keep the conversation going. Great stuff so far. So hyperthemesia, what is it? Well, it's a condition and it's one that uh, leads people to remember large amounts of their life experience. It's almost always autobiographical memory. And they remember it in very, very strong detail, vivid detail. And so there's a lot of interesting documentaries that you can check out on YouTube. Uh, there's a there's a wonderful book called The Woman Who Can't Forget by Jill Price, and this point that I was just raising uh, from from the uh, the scientific literature is is exactly this sort of fascination with the details of things, where and I don't know if it's if it's right or wrong. But in this docu, in a particular documentary, someone has asked the question, and a journalist that followed Jill Price around is, does she really have hyperthemesia, or does she just really obsess over the information? Now, I think the answer is 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 probably both. At the end of the day, um, because she certainly journals quite, uh, or, or at least it it seems that that she does. Um, very intensely. And that certainly would, even if you had hyperthemesia, that certainly would help concretize the imagery um, that you're that you're dealing with, like the life imagery, and it would make things more distinct. But at the same time, it's, it is so uh, detailed and profound in terms of dates and whatnot, that it's hard to doubt that there isn't a condition going on there. And it, it's not like she's the only person. Mary Lou Henner, who's a celebrity, has uh, talked about this. Um, there's many, many people and, and they don't always have, uh, dramatic lives. Um, even though, uh, one would think that that would be very dramatic, but some people seem quite, quite, uh, quite okay. Um, in any case, there's a, there's a very, very interesting history to it. And so the Greek term here, hyper means excessive and thymesis means, uh, remembering. Um, uh, so that's uh, interesting to, to think about the actual words, uh, 
So keep that in mind that, that, that when you come across terms like that, if you want to remember them, we'll just break them apart. So hyper, you know, no, knowing that that means excessive is very helpful. And thumesia or thumesia uh, would, would be um, uh, something that you could think about in terms of memory and uh, remembering, actual remembering. So you could break that down and create some magnetic imagery for it to help you memorize it. Uh, Sayan Yam says, though the amount she put down would be in, insane to memorize, I believe her. Yeah, I don't doubt her at, at all, uh, and we we don't have we don't have any reason to doubt it. We've we the, the there's been verification, and the crazy thing is is that often w the record that they'll verify her against is wrong, and then they'll go and recheck it against another record, and they'll see that she was right. Uh, so there's there's no doubt about it, and the people who have this, they're they're astonishingly correct. Um, but uh, I think that we need to still acknowledge the point, especially when we look at it in the context of these eidetic memory tests and photographic memory tests and the scientific literature's conclusions itself, is that there is an advantage that's coming from uh, some sort of obsessive, like I'm not using obsessive in a negative sense, but rather a positive sense. There's a, an application of conscious repetition going on based on a skill set or a an inborn congenital capability that is being strengthened so uh, as the as the scientific american piece uh, talks about there's there's something inborn going on here there are, perhaps there are pre-existing strengths but there's a zeal as a, a, a real internal focus that's coming through from interest. So being interested in one's own life is a great thing. And a lot of people aren't nearly as interested in their own lives as they should be. Uh, and they punish themselves and put themselves down and they don't see the great value that they have. And so being more interested in yourself is quite potentially a path to improving your memory. And I'm confident that it is. Also, I teach a lot of journaling and I do a lot of journaling myself, not for autobiographical memory purposes, but for putting the right wind in my sails, going in the right direction, um, which I find, find very, very important. And it is a means of remembering to do the things that need to get done so that the details don't get lost and to keep on showing up. Uh, regardless of any problems or struggles that may come along the way. So Joey says, Oliver Sacks wrote about a guy with synesthesia, the man who mistook his wife for a hat. Great book. Uh, and there was a UK documentary about an autistic savant, a young man who would draw with incredible detail. Yep. Uh, that's a great documentary. And Joey says, whilst we have low res memory, we have the advantage of being able to augment with 3D constructs. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of neat things that we can do, and drawing is is quite uh, quite important. So, uh, drawing and journaling uh, for sure, and that's one reason why I love to actually have a memory journal where the memory palaces are kept and the goals are set, and you know it's just this real deep focus. And I think it's it's just understood that top performers tend to be not obsessive necessarily in the negative sense, but they're really focused and they keep showing up. It's the old, uh, it's the old, uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln thing is, you know, if I have to chop down some trees, uh, and I only have six hours, I'll spend the four first four sharpening my ax. Right. And just too many people don't show up that way to the craft is they don't sharpen their ax and they don't realize the 80, 20 rule in life. And so, getting really, really, really focused on what it, what the tools are that you need in order to move forward in life and then honing some mastery around them or craftsmanship around them is really, really important to your success. So keep that in mind if you're not already working that way. So that's a hyperthemesia. There's a lot more about it. Um, so for example, um, there may be a relationship to autism in it, which would be interesting to explore, but perhaps not. Um, and uh, there may also be uh, something something where they have a bit of an advantage in terms of time and space and managing time and space. They may have spatial memory uh, capabilities. Uh, so I haven't gone through enough of that, but it's something to consider and to and to 
to go through. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, even if it is somehow an OCD or obsessive compulsive kind of thing, it it is. Uh, it, it, th there's not enough. We don't know enough about any sort of neurological foundation that people may have in terms of parts of their brain, and and uh, we don't. We just don't know enough about the hippocampus and we don't know enough about all the different kinds of memory. So that's why it's so great that people are studying these cases and then controversies come up and so forth. Um, and incidentally, it's not necessarily all that new. So there's a, a Borges had talked about it in in Funes the Memorius. So you can go read that. There, there's something that happens to that character after he... Um, has a brain injury, so you can check that out. Um, and there's a number of of different uh, things that you can check out related to that in popular culture. So Sayaniam says, what I found interesting to learn was a fairly famous blind man on YouTube said he can't imagine 3D objects. That's interesting. Uh, I haven't seen that one. Um, imagining 3D objects, you know, I would I would ask people, what is it that you imagine when you think about 3D objects? And kind of think about what it, just ask yourself often what your imagination is like. That was very helpful for me because I was, um, you, know, you know, not very visual when I started with memory techniques. And I would still say I'm not that very visual. I don't have aphantasia, but if you ask me what, uh, what I uh, see when I, see a 3d object in my mind I, I don't can't really honestly say i'm able to imagine 3d objects either what does that mean uh and uh i will share with you the link to the material i put together on aphantasia it's one of the videos that that people tend to tend to go to a lot on uh on the, this youtube channel and on the site because I've got a bit of a different view on it, but you can check that out when you like. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm curious just if people would, as a general imaginative technique, what will happen for you when you just start to explore and ask, what is it that I see in my mind and how do I see it? And get much more familiar with how your imagination works. Because I think what you'll discover is that your imagination doesn't work nearly the way that you think it does, right or wrong, uh, you, you'll find that it uh, is a very interesting thing to explore and to ask questions about. Um, and this is a way of keeping, like, you know, people ask about games that will keep their mind sharp and so forth. And uh, the real question I always ask is like, what do you need games for when you could actually just play games yourself with with just asking questions about your own memory and exploring it and uh this is part of what i do with um, the practice of vedanta and self-inquiry is just constantly ask questions about the actual experience that that i'm having uh and this is like the ultimate game in memory the ultimate game in consciousness and it uh will keep your mind sharp so uh you could think about that, but in relation to games that would develop um, photographic memory, well, if we if we agree that actually there is no such thing as photographic memory, then the name of the game would be to find games that actually help you keep your mind sharp relative to your actual goal, your outcome, what it is that you want to do. So um that's important. But in terms of games for developing more observation, which is what I think people generally mean when they are talking about photographic memory and eidetic memory, those kind of games would be like private eye games or eye spy games, observation games, anything where you're observing differences between two scenarios and you're, you know, looking for the differences or where's Waldo kind of games. I'm not, I, I'm not suggesting that those will help you with photographic memory at all because uh, as I determined it, it doesn't actually exist and is not a very good metaphor for memory but it is a way of helping you get better um, better at at uh, observation and being present to information so that is something 
to look into. So Cyanam is is uh, suggesting Tommy Edison's channel. Some in, gives some insights to a blind person, and he's very articulate about his experience. Great, I'm going to check that out. Um, thanks for recommending that. So the Tommy Edison. Oh, he's the uh, blind uh, film critic. Also, yeah, he's cool. Very good. Thanks for that suggestion. I've only watched his uh, film criticism, but I didn't realize that he had a whole uh, a whole channel, the Tommy Edison Experience. Let me share that with you, that link, once I've loaded it up here. I stared at the eclipse, and look what happened to me. There, there he is. I'm Tommy. He stared at the eclipse. OK, so let's share his link. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, yeah, so basically, if you needed games and you were looking for games, I would go for ones that that improve your observation. But I would then try and think about games that would improve your observation for specific outcomes. So observation games that you would you could just make up yourself with language learning, for example, uh, and play those. That would be uh, quite useful, uh, and 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 so on. So, what? Uh, Anybody have any questions or further comments about hyperthemesia or games? Let's uh, gather them up before we move on to the next uh, the next sort of uh, topic here, which is if photographic memory or eidetic memory exists, what would be the symptoms of this? So um, basically, I think that we all in some sense have the option of just practicing this or asking ourselves what our memory is like like this and that's where it's very useful but um we would want to uh to do it in a way that protects us from developing any kind of uh, uh mythology around ourselves so basically the symptoms would be remembering things in very very vivid detail and a way that was picturesque rather than photographic uh, and then if you had hyperthemesia, you would also quite likely memorize the date of, of the, the events that things took place, both to yourself and to others, maybe what was happening around at the time. And uh, ultimately, you know, if you had this kind of memory, then you would want to use it for good. And so you could just ask yourself, if I have this memory, Am I using it for good in the world? <laughs> and then you would have a great answer and go from there. So Joey says, I think the brain can be primed to be more observant. When you buy a car, you immediately notice how many of your car are on the road. So it's consciously priming to be more observant. Yeah, exactly. I mean, priming is a huge thing. Um, and Cyan AM says, yeah, I always seem to start new uh, fashion trends. Right, exactly. <laughs> I have this uh, poem that I wrote and performed a few times back in the day when I was doing performance art and whatnot. And uh, I, always, I, I talk in one of them about the spring and fall fashions needed to survive. And uh, <laughs> it's exactly that sort of thing. Every spring and fall, there are these new fashions. And if you buy one of them, then you start to see it everywhere. So that's an, an observation effect for sure. And very interesting one. Um, it's the same thing if you like, if you're studying philosophy as I do, um, pretty much every day, you you'll you come across a new idea and you'll start to see that idea playing out everywhere, and uh, that can be very exciting. But you have to be cautious because expectation effect can then cause you to then think that you, you know you can get into a confirmation bias where then you think things are true that are not true. Uh, simply because you see it confirmed everywhere and then you stop being skeptical about it. And uh, that's a problem. So Julio is here from Colombia. Great. Uh, great to have you here, Julio. And uh, your question didn't come all the way through, so please type that in again so we can get the full context of your question. Um, so really good uh Good observations today and questions from everybody. But yeah, if you had signs of a photographic memory, I think that the ultimate sign would be if such a power existed, that you would be doing amazing things to help other people with it. And we would know about you because of the amazing things that you were doing. Um, now, 
basically that's uh that's what i wanted to say about uh about this topic of eidetic memory and i hope you enjoyed this session if you want to do some general q a i'll go into mailbox here mailbag for just a minute and uh see if you guys want to talk about anything else and if not then we'll mosey on out of here lots of uh lots of cool things going on things to do the new podcast is out and always have fun with that uh so that is uh, very interesting. Let's see here. Nick says he is having a good time working on the magnetic Mary method. Very good. Um, let's see here. Julio continues, how to leverage the power of our brains based on cleaning the brain blocks daily for a busy life? Okay, that's a good question. Um, well, first of all, think about how your brain is now and get a get a baseline assessment. So one of the things you can do is think about your brain and your memory and your concentration and your focus and make different categories, right? So category one would be memory. Category two would be focus and concentration. And maybe category three would be discipline. Think of those three categories and give yourself a number from one to 10. So if you were in memory, where would you say your memory is from one to 10? If you go to the focus and concentration category, where are you from one to 10? And then when you go to discipline, where are you from one to 10? That's where I would start. Get a really, really good sense of where you're at. So everybody who's here who wants to join in, give me one to 10 in the chat where you're at with your memory between one to 10. and. Uh, that will be very interesting to uh, to know about. Um, so let me know uh, where you're at with that. And uh, Joey says, if I have perfect pitch and can remember the sound of instruments, is that the auditory equivalent of photographic memory? Hmm, perfect pitch is interesting. Again, it's one of those things is like, what do people actually mean when they um, are talking about perfect pitch? So it's... Uh, it's one of those mysterious uh, concepts that's not entirely clear. But if you wanted to think about the auditory equivalent of photographic memory, that is a good way to start to think about it. So thanks for asking that. Um, you know, pitch, perfect pitch to me would not be just, you know, being able to like say, ah, oh, that's an A, but they would also be able to say that the actual hertz, the number of the hertz, right? And then the question always is, is what use would that be? What value would that create as a, as a musician? Now, if you're working in electronic music, to be able to recall the actual hurts of things could be tremendously valuable and lead to discoveries in music that lead to pleasurable sensations, untold, unheard of sensations in musical composition that people have uh, not had before. Um, but... Uh, do you need uh, auditory phonographic memory? Let's call it. Do you need phonographic memory in order to do that? Or do you just need the major method to remember all the hertz that corresponds to all the notes? Um, that would be one thing. And then in terms of knowing what different, uh, different instruments are, well, if you know for certain and you're very good at identifying that, then the question would be, well, how did you get that way, right? So that would suggest some musical training, or it would suggest some fascination with knowing the parts of an orchestra, knowing the potential range of instruments. And then you could just do a test, right? Like you could listen to some Michael Jackson songs, which are often very, very rich in multiple information, and then do a test of, you know, what all those instruments are, and then find the, find the, uh, the history of that particular recording and, and figure it out, or Frank Zappa even, like someone who has really, really dense orchestration in even just the most straightforward rock and roll song would be interesting. So Joey says seven. Great. So that's for memory. Any other numbers going to come in? Um, memory, and then we had focus and concentration and then discipline. In any case, you can do that privately amongst yourselves, but give it a number. And then basically what you want to do is... Uh, is start to create a metaphor. So 
you know, we talk about weak metaphors and we want to talk about strong metaphors. And one thing you can do is give yourself a metaphor for what you want your memory to be like. So if we just go to, you know, uh, memory for me, I want my memory to be like a magnet. Uh, I want it to be like the world is a series of fridges. And when I want to remember stuff, I just stick it to the fridge with a magnet. And then I go and revisit it until that it actually becomes so familiar to me. I don't need to go to the fridge anymore to look at it uh, because I've essentially entered it into my long-term memory. Uh, Carmel says 6.5. Uh, great. So, you know, you're starting, You know, everybody's starting hitting the ground running, which is great. And then you would think about the metaphor that's going to get you to 10. And I like the metaphors that I like, but I like the theater metaphor the best. Um, even though, uh, you know, I have multiple metaphors and I suggest everybody have multiple metaphors. Try to think of the wide range of potential metaphors and then find the best ones for the best situations. You have a toolbox of metaphors. So for example, when I, if I go from focus and concentration, you know, I want laser like focus and concentration. Why? Because it's like sharp cut through the brain fog. I've had such painful brain fog in my life at certain points. So that laser really, really helps. And then when it comes to discipline, my metaphor there is the discipline engine, you know, just like, zoom, 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 zoom. and you know, no matter what's going on, we get done what needs to get done by showing up, showing up consistently and continuing to practice and learn the art and the craft and the science of discipline itself in an engine uh, in an engine like way so that's really really important um, so yeah I always like to give things numbers and then I like to give them metaphors and multiple metaphors try over time to find the most powerful and best metaphors for me that's very good and uh, then keep on moving and refining and, and improving so Sayan Yam says, I'm trying to create the circle of fifths in my mind, though the translations from object to first letter are slow. For example, E, elephant, I see the elephant, but I have to do extra thinking to get the E. Hmm, well, that sounds like uh, um, just a cause for practice. What I would do, though, is if, if you're having a hard time leaping from elephant to E, then maybe you need to put Einstein riding the elephant so that then you've got two E's. And uh, that may 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 help. Um, and then, of course, a lot has to do with what kind of memory palace you might have in the mix um, in order to help you with that. So, you know, keep in mind that spatial memory can help as well get back to the associations. And the other thing you can do is like, OK, so now Einstein is on the elephant and maybe you've got a giant T or E tattooed on the elephant's forehead or Einstein better said is tattooing the elephant with the letter E. So then it's just more prominent and it's leaping out at you. Uh, and then when it's in a memory palace, then even better. So Sayan Yam, I hope that helps you. Let me know if you have further questions on that. Um, Maricella says, I have sometimes number eight, other numbers nine in remembering persons, animals, or plants. Uh, okay, awesome. Um, basically, anything that's numbered, you know, you can, you've got multiple strategies. Joey says, Einstein riding the elephant in ecstasy. Cyan Yam will definitely remember that. <laughs> or taking ecstasy <laughs> while doing it, while being in ecstasy. Great one. Yeah. I mean, just play with it and compound it. Make it, make it stronger. Um, so the, the stronger you make it, the better it will be, uh, definitely. All right, so I wanted to share the metaphor of the theater. And basically, you may have heard me talk about it before, but basically what it is is, you know, instead of a photographic memory, a theatrical memory is one where you have memory palaces and those memory palaces are blocked out, much like actors and directors will block out a theater so the characters know where to stand when they're performing. And they always stand there, so there's no surprises during a performance. Everything works quite well. Obviously, things happen in life uh, that are not controlled. It's not picture perfect. It's not movie perfect. It's not going to replay the same way the same time, because that's not what life is. But theater replays as close to what you want, uh, depending on your practice and, and how you have blocked out the theater. And then um, you're going to want to have a performance. Right. And so your magnetic imagery is now in the theater, which is blocked out. 
and it shows up and performs based on the ability that you have using uh, the, the the techniques with magnetic imagery. And then they they you know you say action and they do the things that they do to bring back the memory to mind and away you go and then you go on to the next theater which would be the next memory palace and uh, you do this a sufficient number of times so that that performance is just flawless and the next thing you know you're you're like the great actors like you see anthony hopkins or whatever he's being interviewed well he doesn't need the theater around he doesn't need the memory palace he'll just whip off some uh some some poetry from shakespeare right the lines they're just there so you should be able to perform no matter where you are in the world. And so that's why I like the theater metaphor a lot better. Uh, and I think you'll find it useful in your life. And uh, I just think of it as a theater where you can put a lot of magnets. <laughs> All right. So Cyan Yam says, well, the elephant is riding a cat. It's a relative minor C. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, the same principles apply. Uh, I think that, you know, the circle of fifths, would still be well served with a memory palace. Uh, well, I don't think I know it'll be probably faster and quicker and more permanent if you if you uh, get a memory palace into the mix, or not even into the mix, but as the grounding basis for what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, so that's uh, that's the way that that uh, goes. Um, so give it a try and let us know how that, that works for you. Let's see here if we got uh, any more. So lots and lots of email to go through. And uh, feel free to pop in any questions or comments that you have. Uh, so that one is an interesting one. So Kyle says, the most frustrating thing about my memory is that when I learn German, I forget more than half of it the next day. So, well, first things first, uh, I would suggest that you congratulate yourself for memorizing half of it, Kyle. That's, uh, start with congratulations. Start with recognizing your wins. Uh, this is really, really, really interesting to and important to do. To just celebrate your wins like wow if you if you actually for, when you say kyle i forget more than half of it the next day what you're actually saying is you remembered half of it which is very very good so recognize that first then build from the foundation think about what you're doing what could you do better there and then add some mnemonics and that would uh, help you a great deal and if you need the enhanced german ebook then we can provide that for you with a link to where to get it and uh, I really love seeing so many people uh, requesting access for the for the uh, magnetic memory method vocab builder. So you don't have to choose all all the words on your own or spend a whole bunch of time, you know, messing around for uh, oodles of words. They're just right there for you in the vocabulary builder. And uh, and uh, there you go. Uh, use the strategies that are there that. Nemonists have been using uh, and improving again and again and again, uh, and just dive in, memorize, make your recall 100% work towards that. It is possible. Joey says, Anthony, are you testing our observation skills? I've counted three different mugs that you're drinking from. Oh, <laughs> well, uh, thank you for paying attention. Um, no, I just was prepared because one of them was going to run out of water. But consider everything an observation test in life. And by the way, if you don't have uh, one of these magnetic memory method cups, you can go to magneticmemorymethod.com forward slash swag. And when I see a picture of you with them, then uh, we'll uh, send you a special memory palace training all about the use of cups for improving your memory. And uh, it's always a joy to send that out to people. So Maricella says, I don't know if it's photographic memory, but I'm help, happy to tell that passing the years, I still remember the person's faces, even though they do not remember me. Well, that's great. So um, some visual uh, memory going on for you there. Awesome. Um, and it's a uh, face memory, of course, is something that you can aid by paying attention to the shapes of people's faces. Um, you there, There's a number of things you can do. Uh, but that's one place to start. 
Simon Yam says, perhaps I can create one in Minecraft. I remember all my created objects. Minecraft might be a great memory palace aid. Yeah, um, there's a, a an episode of the podcast called Tap the Mind of a 10-Year-Old Memory Palace Master, and you can listen to that. Um, I'll look up the link for you. And she talks about using Minecraft as a memory palace. Let me look that up for you quick. I'm not sure uh, to what extent that you will find that um, works for you, but it's well worth giving a try. And I'm sure that her interview will inspire you and uh, give you a great uh, sense of what's possible. I was certainly inspired to talk to Alicia and her dad on that episode. So there's the link for you. She talks about Minecraft there. All right. So let's see if we can find a couple more interesting questions in the mailbag. And if you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world. And if you have comments or questions, pop them in the chat. <laughs> Cyanam says that Minecraft would save him leaving the house. Um, you're welcome for the link. Thank you for saying thank you. You know, one of the things to remember above all is your pleases and thank yous. So I appreciate you saying thank you. It seems so lost on the internet these days. People, um, you know, I, I come from an epistolary generation. We used to write letters to each other, dear so-and-so, and then our letter, and then sincerely, um, and we would sign off with our names and we would say please and thank you all the time. But the internet and this push for speed has erased a lot of um, a lot of that. So I really appreciate it when I see it and point it out because it's important. Um, on the point of, you know, <laughs> Minecraft saving you leaving the house. I know you're joking, but at the same time, one of the things to consider is that if you're not getting the if you're not getting what you need out of spatial memory and memory palaces, then, then it, we, we really need to, um, to make sure that you do get out of the house and feed your spatial memory because it's the strongest resource that we have. Okay, so Philip here says, I'm simply not able to visualize anything at all on the spot. After a couple of hours of focusing, I'm able to produce some visualization that is sticking in my mind for a couple of days but the whole process is a big pain, which is why I'm currently developing my own method containing some of your information. I do hope that I get results in university as I am very bad at memorizing highly technical things. Okay, well, Philip, um, everybody's gonna be developing their own method. That's the, the whole premise of the magnetic memory method is you've gotta make it your own. Um, and uh, that's why I don't talk about systems. You don't, nobody get you, or you not, I do talk about systems, but the systems you create for yourself, nobody is going to um, hand you a system that's going to work in your own brain. You got to understand it from the basis of methods. And the more that you understand it realistically, and you understand it uh, from the basis of the fact that you are the only person who has your brain, then you're going to do so much better. You're going to hit the ground running. And so great attitude that you're going to, you know, use what I teach to uh, develop your own thing because that's what's going to happen anyway. Nobody gets around that. It's like uh, Maricella, she's here. She's part of the Branding You community. Uh, and it's the same thing. Like you can study all the business uh, techniques and strategies in the world that you want, but you've got to be on the path. The map is not the territory. Uh, but you need all the best training that you can get from the entrepreneurs that you admire. And this is the same thing with memory. You, you've got to have guidance from people who actually use this. And if you want to compete, learn from competitors. If you want to complete a PhD or large learning projects or language learners, learn from nemonists who complete those kinds of things and learn from them both anyway. But, you know, really think about what your goals and outcomes are, what you desire and uh, find those people and learn from them and, you know, set them uh, set them up to help you by meeting your teachers halfway. So many people coming back to the please and thank you thing. So, so many people just look for handouts and they don't even do anything as if some magical one sentence answer is going to, going to help. The only thing that's going to help is that you study the techniques and you implement the techniques and you practice them. And 
one of the sad things that's been going on in the internet era in particular, but was already always there, is that people are expecting instant on world. And uh, it's just not the reality. So we need more truth tellers who are going to say, look, here's what you do. And, and, and you get these skills by showing up to the art and craft and memory of them. And, you know, we talked today about giving yourself a number one to 10 for memory, focus and concentration and discipline. Then once you know that number, create the metaphor that is going to help drive you towards getting it to 10 or as close to 10 as you can get. It's really, really powerful. The other thing I noticed in Philip's email here is he says that, uh, um, I'm very bad at memorizing highly technical things. Why, why say that? Why not just say, I am now working at getting better at memorizing highly technical things, and then maybe even change that. Highly technical? Really? Just how technical are they? If you just treat information as, as information and don't mystify it, don't contrast it with any other information and just break it down to its essential components and focus on it for what it is, then you have a better chance of dealing with it for what it is. But if you, oh my goodness, this is so difficult, man. If I did that to myself, I wouldn't have learned a damn thing, right? It's just, it doesn't make sense to do this. And yet we do it all the time. And look, I'm sympathetic to it because I did it a lot, but you've got to stop doing it to information. There is no information in the world that has some special power that is somehow more aggressive or strange or difficult than any other, except for when you decide that it is. And people go around deciding that it is all the time. And it's sad to see. And I know how sad it is because I've done it. And it's just, it doesn't make any sense. There is no information on the planet that has some special power to be more difficult than other information. There's just you telling yourself a story and then obeying the rules of the story that you set. So tell a better story and then show up to the information differently and you'll have a much better experience and you won't need luck or anything like that. Fortune just smiles on the brave who really change the nature of the game who are brave enough to change the rules of the game so that it works in your favor. And, you know, when you talk about the matrix and all this, you know, next level ninja thinking and all these things that people talk about, it's really that simple. The world is based on rules, but you get to understand those rules and you get to set the conditions so that the rules work in your favor, which is another way of saying you get to set the rules, even if there are rules that are imposed upon you. So that's important to understand. Adanath is here, says, thank you for your kind efforts. Thank you, Adanath, for uh, saying that. I appreciate it. Thumbs up to you. If you're just joining us, hit that thumbs up. Let me know you're engaged with some chat uh, messages into the uh, message box there, and uh, let me know where you are in the world. Uh, Joey says, I think that it is not that the people can't remember. It's what we give up. In fact, we just need to enhance using strategy. Instead of giving up, we need to try a different method. Amen. I totally agree with you, Anthony. Don't give up, Philip. Just try something different. Exactly. So, um, yeah, there's there's something very, very important and powerful, and it's a message that we need to hear again and again and again and again. Uh, I, I I do. I, I need to hear it again and again. I have all kinds of inspiring teachers that I learn from again and again and again. So Sayan Yam says, a quote I really I appreciate recently is when you knock on when you knock the door of your future, the only person who answers is yourself. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Um, very good one. I like that. Maricella says, still reading the German language book is very interesting, but I'm reading it slow. I dream to take tips and practice it. Awesome. Or to take trips and practice it. Great, great. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to read any uh, book overnight. Um, and uh, there's I mean, this, this is the thing. The, the method for uh, vocabulary is something that if you just um, understand it and set it up properly from the beginning, then you, you'll, you'll have a great, uh, a great, great time and really, really enjoy uh, the process. It's only difficult when, when you don't understand it and you don't take the time to understand it and set it up properly. Uh, it's like uh, going to the gym and not learning the moves properly. You can hurt yourself really badly. Now, in this case, you're not going to hurt yourself, but you'll slow yourself down. Um, and speaking of uh, setting yourself up properly, oh, this camera frustrates me. I don't know why some of the cameras mirror things, but anyway, I got this book, The Bravest You, reading it now. 
um, and Adam Kirksmith. He had had me on his podcast, which was great. Uh, this is the dust jacket. The actual book is in my favorite reading spot. Um, but shout out to, to him and uh, got to work on having this camera better. Uh, so Arth writes, thank you, Anthony. I admire people like you. Well, thank you, Arth, for the kind words. Appreciate that. Um, Terry writes, I'm from Malaysia. And whenever I learn something, I realize I can easily forget it within one or two days. I use mind maps and flashcards to remember scientific concepts. I found you when I typed in how to remember a movie or series because I thought to myself, I want it to be memorable. Oh, wow. So that's interesting. Someone found that uh, that podcast. If you haven't heard that one, that's uh, where we talk about using Breaking Bad as a memory palace and other series. It says, uh, I also struggled with my consistency to follow my goal and schedule because I do not regard it as important. Your memory palace technique is new for me. And I believe this is something that I'm, I will put to good use after hearing from others on how useful your training is. Okay, great. Excellent. Really appreciate that. Uh, I love when people spread the word, uh, you know, you can uh, let people know verbally or share links to this channel or to magnetic memory method itself. And, uh, Really appreciate everyone uh, doing that. This is a grassroots effort, and we love uh, having the support from the community. So if you haven't already, hit that thumbs up and uh, share this material around. Um, Travis writes, I was coached by Tenzel Ali a couple of years ago, and I still use the stuff he taught me all the time. Having said that, always interested in refining or improving my methods. I've been following your stuff on and off for years, but I was excited when I realized you had moved around the corner from me. Oh, well, there you go. Thank you, Travis. So um, interesting. Do I ever do any live events in Brisbane? If so, I'd be interested in attending. You know, I might well do some. Um, but in any case, I love this uh, email from Travis here because uh, essentially what he's uh, saying here is that he's always interested in refining or improving his methods. Excellent. This is, this is the way that it needs to be because it, as in physical performance and fitness, if you don't use it, you will lose it and you got to keep growing and growing and growing. So awesome to read that. Um, so that's uh, pretty awesome to read. Love this. I love doing uh, the mailbag and really appreciate everybody emailing in. And I love when I get Memory Palace drawings from people. There's a great one from David here. Still working on this live stream technology. I don't know why I wanted to use OBS today, but it just wasn't working. So we got to try a different thing. Um, if anybody is a live stream wizard and you have, uh, you want to do some mentoring, let me know. I'd love to learn more about how to do this properly. It's uh, one of those things, you you know, when you when you think about discipline and so forth, got to show up one way or the other and just keep working at it. And, and uh, even then, sometimes things won't work out the way that you would like. Uh, okay, this was someone. I remember that. Yep, do a little bit more mailbag. If you have any questions, pop them into the chat and we will uh, we'll answer them up. Or if you have any any comments or observations, on today's topic, that would be awesome as well. We got uh, some guest posts coming out. That's very good. Um, Maria writes that it's frustrating to have to go over the same issues many times as if they were always the first time. Yeah, I can imagine that being super frustrating. So one of the things to do is to start to cultivate an awareness that you're receiving new information and you just go, oh, this is, you know, start to recognize this is the first time that I'm hearing this better pay attention and then encode it as quickly as you can. Even if it's just the slightest link, then, you know, work with it and you'll get it into memory. You will get it into memory uh, much more likely if you actually start to pay attention to it on that basis. So Fotis writes, I'm disappointed in my memory skills because I did bad on a test that I had a week before and I had really studied a lot for it. I don't want to fail like that at the final exam. Yeah, well, 
don't beat yourself up. That's one thing to really consider. And then think about the nature of the test, Fotis. One of the problems, you know, I didn't really have problems with tests uh, when I was a kid, except for multiple choice tests. And they're not fair. They're not properly constructed. And so it can be very counterintuitive what you're answering there relative to the wording. So um, sometimes you can blame the test. And you don't have to blame yourself. So consider that. But no matter what, no matter where the responsibility lies, never beat yourself up. There's more tests to come. Life is a series of tests and there'll be more tests and tests upon tests upon tests. So if you start the bad habit of beating yourself up over performance and then start the bad habit of worrying about tests that haven't even happened yet, then your mind's not going to be as focused as it could be on just dealing with the information in front of you as it is on its own basis. So that's uh, really important to, to think about. And I uh, really sympathize because I put myself through the ringer with tests like you wouldn't believe. Uh, and it's not helpful. It's not helpful at all to, to do that. All right. So let's see here. Joy says, suggestion to being disappointed with tests. In the same way we we can use methods to improve memory, we can use NLP reframing to amend how we emotionally feel. Yeah, great point. Um, framing is everything. That's what, you know, that's why I'm suggesting that you give yourself a one to 10 and then a better metaphor and maybe multiple metaphors to play with because what that's gonna do for you is exactly um, help you uh, have a frame in the first place. So a lot of us, we don't even know, like theoretically, there's always a frame in play. There's always a metaphor in play, but we not, we might not be aware of it. And uh, so then we're being controlled and ruled by it, which um, absolutely sucks, right? But instead, what we can do is we can be really, really confident and certain and in control of the metaphors that we use and, uh, and improve them over time. So great point there. Um, from Joy. Thank you for that. All right. So let's see here. Oh, this is quite a, uh, quite a detailed one. We'll have to answer that. Um, let's see. This is from uh, GC in the master class. I decided I would memorize the entire New Testament Quite an endeavor, right? That's actually what brought me to Googling and finding your site. I may have made a list of, I have made already a list of memory palaces and about to take the next step. Okay, excellent. Just wanted to write and say thank you for an exciting program. Awesome. So yeah, that's a cool goal. Um, thanks for letting me know about that. I love when I am informed about your goals and whatnot. That way I can uh, prepare myself for any questions that come. Um, really amazing goal. So, Christopher's just letting me know that he has 20 memory palaces in play. Nice. Uh, Harvinder was on a recent live stream and he said he had did 67 during the month that we did the, uh, the dream intensive, the magnetic memory method. Dream Recall Intensive 67. Can you imagine coming up with 67 memory palaces just from your dreams? So that was awesome. Um, so Cyan Yam says, you, you said you don't imagine 3D objects. I can see a 3D object rotated, etc." Yeah, well, I can, I wouldn't say I can see, but I developed through using some exercises, the ability to rotate things around, move things around mentally and so forth. But I, I would be, I would, it would be incorrect to say that I'm doing it 3D. Um, maybe it would be incorrect to say that I'm not doing it 3D. I'm not sure. It's a mysterious thing to me, but what I would encourage people to understand is that that's not even necessary in order to use memory techniques. It's not necessary for using memory palaces. There's no time for it. If you want to be able to memorize things on the fly, uh, if you saw the live stream before where I was memorizing Chinese lyrics on the fly, I don't have time to sit around and making sure everything's in 3D or even really memory, uh, really visualizing the memory palace. I had to focus just on spatial memory for what it really is, 
and unlock its full powers and then unlock the full powers of episodic memory and semantic memory and procedural memory and just weave it as quickly as possible together in a way that works. And so those mental exercises do help and they're well worth working on. But at the end of the day, the real work is to sit there and actually use the memory techniques. And then it doesn't matter whether it's 3D or not. All that matters is does it call back the information? That's the game, and that's the one that I play. So I think that it'd just be, it, it, I mean, it could be that I actually am perceiving things in 3D, uh, even though I don't feel like I am. But to me, it's an irrelevant question. The question is, can I remember what I, what do I, what I encode? Right? Can I decode it? And that's all I focus on. And I encourage people to not get hung up on um, the ins and outs of of mental rotation except for where it applies to the goal, the outcome. And uh, this is this is one of those tricky things where you you're you're better off saving the pondering and the fantasizing after you have the skill. Uh, and then you then you can go into the labyrinth of potential speculation on what's possible until the nth degree based on the satisfaction of having developed the skills. But one of the problems is that people get wound up into the vertiginous world of pondering and speculating and, and theorizing without actually the practical skill. Now, we need some theory in order to guide our development of the skill and the application of the skill, which will, you know, is just basically what is needed. And then that'll help create more theory, which then should go back and improve the practice. And that's the perfect circle I hope to help people create. But, you know, uh, the the actual ins and outs of what is going on in the mind is what matters is that it uh, that it's used effectively. So that's, uh, that's something to really focus on. Um, and so again, like, Yes, you can practice rotation, and I've done a lot of rotation practice, and in the long term, it really, really helps, and it's something that's taught in the free course. If you don't have that free course, then, you know, please go and get it. I will put a link for you to it right now. Um, it does talk about mental rotation exercises there for you and teaches you them so that you can develop it, but the name of the game is that it's going to be a so. Uh, directed at learning goals that you actually want to accomplish. So that link is in the chat for you and clink it, click it, clink it. <laughs> Maybe it'll make a clinking sound when you click it. That'd be pretty cool. Um, so there you go. So Cyan Yam, yeah, surely I can, but it's not necessarily what's going to get the job done at the end of the day. There's no time when you, when you want to um, memorize names, you know, You've got to be able to really do it quickly and not fuss around. And it's a skill. It's a skill that's explainable and it's taught in detail. And the definitive factor, the thing that's going to make the difference, is that you save the theorizing for after and just sort of follow the follow the instructions and put them into practice. Um, that's what we see again and again and again with the, all the success stories that we've we've created. So. Dota says, if you want to imagine something, you have to make a bizarre image. Uh, yeah, the, well, that helps, but it's not necessarily that it has to be bizarre. It can just be big. It could be dynamic. It, what matters more is that you're tapping into the magnetic modes. And those magnetic modes are what matter. And it's not always bizarre. You know, Maricella, I don't know if you're still here, but you were concerned about uh, the uh, gun that I used at the Sydney Opera House with um, with the with Chewbacca and Chewbacca has a Jewish dreidel there and the band Manowar has a gun and the Sonic Youth is involved with Goo their album Goo and then uh, the UN building so I can remember that Opera House in Chinese and the tones are one four four um, I can remember that it's a Gu Chu Yuan uh, my tones are maybe not perfect yet, but uh, in any case, you were concerned that that was a violent image and so forth. But to me, it's not violent at all. To me, it's it's just a great image and it, and it's a good image. And and you're right to be concerned. But at the end of the day, there's nothing really bizarre about it. It's only that it's tapping into the right memory resources 
the ones that you have for yourself, if you just learn what those memory resources are, what those kinds of memory are, and how to pair them with space so that you can hear information once and memorize it and have it have it perhaps forever. Um, you'll have it forever relative to how you perform recall rehearsal and how you put it into use. So great point, but it doesn't have to be bizarre. And I don't think that what I created there seem to have remembered it with no problem. And all the names there, I don't think any of those images were bizarre. They were just tapping into the right kinds of memory all at the same time. Spatial, starting with spatial, always starting with spatial. That's, imagine trying to build a sculpture uh, out of heavy stone floating above the air. That's like, that's kind of basically the problem that a lot of people have. So Christopher writes that his memory is good, but he's just never been able to get where he can use a memory palace effectively. And it's quite likely that he's not using the magnetic modes to build the memory palace in the first place, which is something you'll want to consider uh, if you're having troubles. So thanks for that email. Uh, Sayan Yam says, I was thinking of creating non-symmetrical objects for orientation and adding things in them. I guess this is too much on the mind. No, not at all. I mean, any exercise that you want to do is great. I mean, it sounds like you already have some chops. So take what I'm saying, you know, as advice for wherever you are with your journey. And if it's not useful, then, then don't worry about it. But, um, the, the main, the main thing is, is what is the outcome? Is it, if it's just for the pure, uh, joy of working with your mind. Awesome. No complaints. Uh, do it. Um, but if you're, you know, thinking that this is going to lead to language learning, uh, outcomes or math outcomes or names outcomes and so forth, still pursue it, give it a try, but then think about, is it actually working? Is it helping? Or would just memorizing more names be the practice that you need, especially in real life situations? So I'm doing a trial now. I stopped it, I put it on pause when I went to Sydney and I found it very interesting, which is to memorize names from software. And uh, I got to a certain level, that's fine, but I worried that I was jinxing myself for real life situations because I don't care about being able to memorize with software. And I, you know, I could punish myself and say, oh, I didn't get this or that level. I should be able to or whatever. I only care about being able to go into rooms and memorize every single person's name there, you know, and, and I have a week where it's like 50 new names and I'll remember them the next time I see them uh, because that's where the skill matters. And there's never any situation that I've ever been in where I have to, you know, uh, memorize an increasing number of names in a, in a computer software setting. That never happens in real life. Why practice for that? I'm doing it as an experiment to see to see what might happen, and all I find is more confirmation that there's something deeply wrong with. Uh, with the way that the program is set up and there's something deeply wrong with practicing my memory that way for my conviction that it needs to be for actual goals. So one of the problems there with that software is that it, um, it will show you names that will never be the names that people who look like that ever have. So that's a big problem. Like, yes, it may stretch you in a particular way. It, that would be to use your term, Cyan Yen, that would be asymmetrical. It's asymmetrical in some sense. Now, arguably, it could be that uh, that you will have situations like that. I'll never forget the guy I met named Gengador Dianand, right? Like, you just don't meet people with names like that. Uh, even uh, a week and a half ago, I met Mungo. Mungo, like, you know, you don't meet people like that every single day. But I don't think that uh, training with software helped me figure out quickly how to memorize those names worth 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 a shred of practice with those softwares if anything i think it's degenerative the thing that helps is going out in public meeting people and memorizing their names so you know always think about the outcome first and be cautious because some of these exercises can potentially actually be uh, they could retrograde your skills that you're trying to to memorize so dota asks what is the difference between the soul and the brain? Dota, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I think we have to establish that the soul actually exists first. The brain is a mechanism that monitors certain activities of the body and the mind and uh, produces the mind. 
And if there is anything that lives on after the brain is dead, we don't know what it is. And so the difference between the soul and the brain is that the brain exists. We can point to it. We can see it. We can measure it. We can scan it. We can do all kinds of things. The soul, no, nobody's really had any compelling uh, evidence that such a thing exists yet. We have a sense of ourself and that sense of self is very, very uh, sensitive. It's very easy to disrupt. Just uh, think of the last time you got angry, right? It was yourself was disrupted like that because of some external thing. And you were one way, one second, and then you were another way, another second, right? We're, whatever that thing that we call the self is, is so unstable. It is so incredibly unstable, and yet it's somehow unstable because it's being produced by the mind. And then the sense of soul that one gets, especially when they work on themselves and they work on eliminating the, the sense of identity and the ego and so forth, even that is quite easily disrupted. But we know that meditation is creating more consistency in the psychological experience because of what it's doing to the actual physical brain. And so the difference between brain and soul is that, first of all, we don't know that there is a soul. And second of all, we know that the brain is a physical entity that follows certain rules and that you can change the shape of that physical entity to produce different kinds of experience. And external events can also produce different kinds of experience. And so the brain is a physical thing that is monitoring and creating physical states and conscious states of consciousness that are manipulable. You can manipulate them yourself, or they can be manipulated by external circumstances. And you can work on yourself in such a way that you're much less likely to be manipulated by external circumstances because you have become more aware. And some of the ways that you do that uh, are through meditation practices of particular kinds that improve your focus and your concentration. What I like to do is um, self-inquiry and uh, doing a, a lot of uh, chanting these days of uh, the Ripu Gita from, from the Sanskrit, knowing what the English is. And these self-inquiry questions are really useful when external events happen that uh, make you think that the external world has, has uh, you know, some deep importance that it actually doesn't. So that's quite, uh, quite good uh, to think about. So interesting and compelling question, but I think at the end of the day, the, um, what it all leads to is just thinking more scientifically about this concept of the self rather than the soul. What is the self? Where does it come from? And, uh, you uh, will have great, great benefits from doing that and just asking self-inquiry questions. So I really like um, I really like the Ribhu Gita that Gary Weber puts together in uh, in uh, Evolving Beyond Thought, which is the sequel to Happiness Beyond Thought. And it goes Chitameva Mahadosham, Chitameva Hi Balakala, Chitameva Mahatmayam, Chitameva Mahanasat, which means how do my thoughts behave? Are they useful? Right and uh, Chitameva hi mithya atma, chitam shashavish anavat, chitam nasti sada satyam, chitam vandyaku meravat, which means just how unreal are my thoughts. Now, I won't go through the whole thing, but um, what's very, very fascinating about it is when you begin to ask yourself these questions, wow, you just be like, oh, yeah, just how unreal are my thoughts? And you begin to think very differently about it. And you, th the world disrupts you differently. I mean, everybody has problems. I got all kinds of problems. Things are going on all the time. You can't, things are just like humming along. And, you know, you can't anticipate and you think everything's gotten stable, especially when you have websites and the internet and even trying to do live streams like this, like I was trying to use OBS today. And it's like, what the heck is not working? And just, uh, you know, instead of anger coming and so forth or frustration, just be like, yeah, well, I can click this other button over here and it'll work. And then, you know, I had this thing up here. I wanted it to all look cool and it wasn't looking cool. It was distracting me because it's backwards because I got the wrong camera on. And I can sit there and, you know, have uh, that all be bothered, bothering me, but it, it doesn't. I just take it away. Who cares? Um, <laughs> it's, it's like that simple. <laughs> and uh, there's like all kinds of criticisms one could have, but they just go away when you clean your mind. Um, and then good things come to you. Uh, it's great. So 
yeah, I'd focus more on the self and what's producing the self and then get yourself a means of, of stepping in between yourself and the self that you think you are and manipulating your brain chemistry because you can actually intervene. And I'll leave uh, Gary Weber to explain all that science. And you can, uh, let me, let me link you to Gary's channel. He's got some new videos on recently. I was listening to the second of three new videos that he's released. And, uh, I think you're going to find them really, really great. And I would love for you to uh, become a fan of his, get subscribed to his channel. I know that uh, uh, I received an email lately. Someone was thanking me for introducing him to Gary Weber. Oh, let's see here. That somehow was putting in a link that's just way too long. I need to get, create Gary a special magnetic memory method web link that will send people over there. There you go. So that's Gary Weber's channel. Get subscribed and uh, watch his videos. The one that I watched uh, this morning was Stop Suffering, Let Go of Your Attachments, or Listen to, better said. Really, really powerful. And he's got the one there on the Ripu Gita that I was just reciting a little bit of. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. All right. Dota says, Darren Brown is amazing. Yeah, I love Darren Brown. Darren Brown's awesome. He's got good stuff in a book called Tricks of the Mind uh, about memory. And uh, he... He also speaks German or used to speak German. There, I've never been able to find it, but there's a cool video where he's um, he's speaking German. And uh, I guess he used memory techniques a lot for law, uh, his law studies. And uh, I'm sure he uses memory techniques every day in his performance and whatnot. Um, and Dota says, thank you, sir. Oh, thank you, Dota. Great question. Compelling question. I love your guys' questions. Keep them coming. If you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know in the chat where you're from. And, uh, if you have questions, pop them in. Uh, Maricella says, question. I'm drawing my memory palace, but the rooms are empty. There are not pieces of furniture or four stations. No problem. In fact, that may be a blessing. So just keep it simple. Use the corners if there's no furniture, uh, to work with. Uh, Maricella says, I do not know, but I want to grab in my memory, short and long-term positive thoughts. Great. Well, subscribe there to Gary Weber's channel, support his work by getting a copy of happiness beyond thought and evolving beyond thought and really, uh, really go through his material because it, it it's almost like positive thoughts or how about no thoughts or less thoughts and just being in what's called persistent non-symbolic experience um pnse persistent non-symbolic experience and then uh, then you're free <laughs> altogether now i haven't totally mastered this yet myself but i've experienced these wonderful periods of it and uh it's amazing now i would say ultimately it feels very positive but even then one of the teachings there is that uh is that that would just lead to an attachment, right? An attachment. And I found that suffering does come. So when my persistent non-symbolic experiences come to an end, then I'm just like, oh, did I do something wrong? <laughs> you know? And then the, like, it's very, uh, it's very possible to just slip into a kind of self-punishment thing and feeling badly about it. So I think um, what I like about the Ripu Gita is that it is very, very scientific, and it's leading to non-symbolic experience that is, as Gary says, beyond thought, right? It's, it's happiness beyond thought. And positivity is a thought. It's mental content. And so short and long term, I'm working to go beyond it. <laughs> and uh, his book has been a great help. I didn't think it would actually be possible, but um, it, it was pretty amazing how quickly it started to work. And uh and continues to start to work, but everything that comes into consciousness will leave consciousness. And so um, that's important to understand. By the way, I wanted to make a shout out to Dequaf. She sent me this uh, wonderful postcard, which says greetings and gratitude from her location. Um, and uh, she says, wishing you a magical day in every way. Cheers from Dequaf. And it has some beautiful, beautiful um, uh, seashell uh Stamps, really beautiful. And uh, it's the Cherokee alphabet. And what it says here is that Sequoia was born between 1760 and 1770 in Tuskegee, Tennessee. He's best known as the inventor of the Cherokee alphabet. After seeing the advantages white men had with a written language, Sequoia developed his 85 character syllabary over a 12 year period. 12 years to develop this alphabet. Isn't that amazing? 
what a beautiful alphabet too. So I'm really looking forward to learning more about this. And thank you, Dequa. If you want to send me stuff, uh, the address is on the Magnetic Memory Method website. And uh, it will be updated if it ever changes. We get uh, lots of neat things. Again, uh, thanks to Julie for sending this Batman cup. Awesome. And uh, <laughs> always appreciate that. Uh, we're getting we're getting lots of cool things. Uh, <laughs> very nice. Um, but I don't get attached to them. That's for sure. Um, so that's an important thing. Uh, okay, Cyan Yam says, um, trying to find the, the thread here. Prayer beads are almost like a meditation for affirmations. It's a possession. Uh, hard to get away from, though. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say about it, but uh, think about... Uh, Think about alternatives, you know. Uh, again, Gary Weber's channel would be interesting because you could just turn your fingers into prayer beads with Kirtan Kriya, right? So that is a possession that you know you have to leave, right? And uh, yet you can enjoy it in its fullness every time you use it. And you can use it in multiple ways, forward and backwards and all these sorts of things. And basically there's different ways to use it. A great brain exercise is like sa ta na ma, but then sa na ta ma, and so that's skipping, uh, and uh, that ooh, it feels good. I get a little spike right there. So I'm attached to these hands, but I know that they're coming to an end. So I enjoy them in their fullness and use them. Anyway, happiness beyond thought and evolving beyond thought. <laughs> definitely, definitely get those books. You will not regret it. Cyan Yam says, never thought of that. I'll try it. Yeah. And then think about what you can do. You know, I wouldn't necessarily get away, throw your prayer beads away right now, but think about what you can do to um, gradually replace them. And then, of course, you want to be able to um, do the chanting in your mind, but you can also do the, uh, do as he teaches, uh, you can do the the Ripu Gita with this. So Chitameva Mahadosham, Chitameva Hi Baraka, Chitameva Mahatmayam, Chitameva Mahana Sat. And that's just like a cool way of centering your body and being more with yourself, being more in yourself while you're practicing your memory and while you're um uh, you know releasing yourself from attachments. Very powerful. So Sayanyam says, never thought of that. I'll try it. Thanks. Well, thank you. Great to have you here and thank you for your engagement. Uh, Dota says, is sex better for memory? Whoa. <laughs> because it depends on who you're having sex with. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been meaning to do uh, some research on memory and sex and to see what, what's coming up there. But what I would say is that there's certainly a, a period in, in life, I can only speak for myself, where, um, where, a concentration on sowing one's seed gets in the way of focusing on uh, on learning and, and memorizing. And so the trick is, is to deal with it, to manage it, and to have a great time and be safe. So, um, and make memory palaces. <laughs> so, you know, I've had uh, lots of fun in my day and uh, lots of memory palaces came out of it as a result and played safe. So, um, that was all great. And, you know, one of the things in this, I think is for all people is that if you don't have a life partner or you don't have a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever, it, if part of your brain is focused on that. And so you might want to solve that in your life. If it's dragging you down, it can get in the way of your focus and concentration. There's no doubt about it. And not having an, a, not having a healthy sexuality can be something that really, really is bad for your brain. Um, I'm not a doctor. This is not medical advice, but it is something to look into. And then, of course, we have the issues on the internet where, you know, people are going on what they call no fap challenges and they're saying they feel much better afterwards. And no doubt, because if you're draining your resources of your brain all the time on a couple of things like, hunter-gatherer syndrome, you're constantly scouring the internet for uh, the next fix, 
uh, and then actually physically draining your body of the energy from those activities, then uh, yeah, that's going to that's going to be a problem. And by having proper balance in your life and a good good relationships or however you conduct yourself, but doing it in a in a way that that is healthy and safe and leads to the creation of new memory palaces. And, uh, you know, you can do learning goals together with your partner and memorize certain things that you might like to do together. It's all good. <laughs> so good question, Dota. And I have thought about it before, but uh, now, uh, now we have the skeleton outline for the blog post and po podcast episode yet to come. Awesome. Thank you for that. If you're just joining us, hit the thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world, what you're doing, what you're thinking. We'll, uh, we'll go through some questions here. So someone was asking me about bridge and memorizing cards and uh, saying it's not so much about remembering every card, but remembering which higher cards are out and how many. So basically the way that you would do this is to make sure you can memorize every card and then just memorize the ones that you want based on the same system. So be comprehensive about that. Great question though. I like talking about bridge. Um, then uh, Isaiah is asking, is the memory palace the best way to memorize music? And I would say, you no, know, not necessarily. Um, memorizing music is a complex thing. So when we talk about memorizing music, what are we talking about? Are we talking about memorizing music theory? Are we talking about memorizing notation? Are we talking about pitch? Are we talking about uh, composition? What is it? Uh, people need to be clear in their questions and then we can dive in. But it, when it comes to notes, we have a live stream all about that. And I share what I've done for that. And the instrument becomes the memory palace. And that will work with just about any instrument, particularly instruments with keys and frets. Um, and even instruments that don't have dedicated frets have implied frets. And uh, that's where memorizing the hertz of different notes might become handy uh, for you. Uh, okay. Siam Yam says, I think it's dopamine desensitization makes life dull when you go away from porn, etc. The brain recovers and you feel you start to feel the dopamine from normal life. Yeah, that's definitely uh, certainly something that's in the brain science there. Uh, but I think also too, right, is that you may develop a lack of certain confidence and so forth. Uh, and that can be quite destructive. So that's a uh, good thoughts on that. Mr. Space, thanks for being here, Mr. Space. What should be my first steps to remember things? Well, here's a here's a link for you to a free course. That should be your first step. And it'll uh, take you to the opportunity to get some videos and some worksheets for creating memory palaces. I always recommend people master the memory palace technique. And the reason why is that if you want to memorize languages, if you want to memorize uh, formulas, if you want to memorize names and so forth, you're going to want to build on the foundation. So a lot of people who have large learning goals, which is who we help, uh, we focus on helping, they uh, they really need to start from the foundations and build from the ground up. And often the way memory techniques are taught are from the roof down and people collapse pretty quickly because they don't have a foundation to build upon. So Mr. Space, please go and get that free course. Get subscribed to this channel if you're not already subscribed hit the thumbs up and uh, continue asking questions. And the best questions come from being on the journey. And what that means is that you are actually using the techniques and you come across issues. And then in the masterclass, if you ever happen to join us there, there's a FAQ section where we go through many questions uh, and no stone is left unturned for the application of the techniques. And uh, there are examples in the training courses as well. So you're able to uh, to to see uh, what's going on there and get the benefit as a result. All right. So I love going through mailbag. We'll do a little bit more mailbag. If you're just joining us, hit that thumbs up. Let me know where you are in the world and let me know as well any questions that you have. And uh, looking for another question here. So, do I have any tips for creating a memory palace for memorizing prefixes and suffixes for medical terminology and anatomy? Indeed, I do. Um, 
it's very important to just treat the words as words. And when you, when you do that, you're able to have uh, a comprehensive approach. And if you just want to remember a bunch of prefixes, then just treat them as words. If you just want to memorize a bunch of suffixes, then treat them as words. And uh, this can be very, very powerful. And one of the cool things about memorizing uh, some Sanskrit now is I'm seeing the origins of, of many words uh, that we have in English. So that's cool. But I don't, you know, go through looking for root words. But if I were going to, then I would isolate root words and I would just focus on memorizing them as words that have that particular designation as if they were the full words and not treating them particularly in any special way. And uh, if then we were getting into into a grammar situation or, or uh, you know, something for irregular or re regular verbs, then I'd memorize examples and make sure that they're in the context of phrases. Um, but if you just want to memorize what prefixes tend to indicate, then rack them and stack them in a memory palace, uh, but don't treat them as individual words. I would, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, you need to think about your outcome and your goal. So uh, often the questions that I receive are, are not specific enough. They're, and, and so the answer can't be, can't be as specific as I would like. But if it is to understand what prefixes tend to add to the meaning of the word, then that's a different approach than, well, I would just like to, you know, I would just like to because, right? Because that may not be a strategy that you actually need. You might need the whole, the whole word. So that's, uh, that's something to keep in mind. Um, Dale writes, I've watched your YouTube and found you, uh, uh, reading a book. Oh, I found you from reading a book summary, uh, on how to win friends by Dale Carnegie. Wow. Cool. Uh, memory training is so misunderstood and overlooked yet can greatly improve business communications. I'm glad to have discovered this and will share it with my family. Great. Thank you for that. Let's see, Mernaz says, thank you for your useful material. I make use of it a lot. The problem I have is that in recalling information, I don't know how to organize information in my brain to recall it quickly. I'd be very pleased if you'd advise me regarding this problem. Well, uh, it's very simple. Using memory palaces will organize your mind. It'll organize the information in your mind. And then what you end up having is a kind of connections that build on autopilot between information. Uh, I call that the rhizomatic effect. And Lynn Kelly, who wrote The Memory Code, and I, we had a chat recently, and she was talking about how she experiences that as well. Um, so you almost want to supersede or transcend organizing information in your mind by having it organize itself through a structured layering of, of, the, of the rhizomes under the soil through the use of memory palaces. So this is uh, something very important to, to, uh, to understand and put into action. Great. So... Habib says, what frustrates me about my memory is how long it takes me to commit things into memory for short term. Flashcards, study guides, and reading a chapter has never worked for me. However, I can listen to a song I haven't heard for years. I loved and recite the lyrics word for word. <laughs> yeah, that can happen. Um, but one of the things is, is, can you really recite the lyrics word for word or can you recite a percentage of them and then you're filling in the blanks due to the logic of, of uh, language, right? So there's uh, often that effect that one experiences, but it, it's half and half. Um, not saying that, you, that that's not what you experience, but it is interesting to dig a little bit deeper. And are you experiencing what you actually think you're experiencing? Or is it that you're filling in the blanks a certain percentage of the time? All right. So something to consider there. And I think that's about it. That's all the mailbag will do today. But I want to thank everybody for being here. Some great, great comments and, uh, and many interesting questions. 
Really appreciate that. Thank you all for being here and uh, participating and really a wide range of topics. <laughs> appreciate that. Mr. Space says, thank you for the advice. Thank you. And uh, please do grab that course. I will pop that into the chat one more time. If any of you are here and you're not in the free course, please do take it. It's very good. And uh, thousands of people have taken it and benefit from it. And remember that memory training is something that you, you do by learning and understanding the techniques and you have to apply. Um, it's like a martial art in many ways. You, it's not a spectator sport. You got to be in the dojo. And in order to learn from the teacher, you got to meet them halfway. You've got to actually spar. You've got to be part of the, uh, of the behaviors that lead to the result. And the more you think about that result that you want, and you really give it some thought and give it a metaphor, the more it will pull you towards itself. So as we talked about earlier, give your memory and your focus and your concentration and your discipline and number and create metaphors for them that will help you develop a pull. A magnetic pull, you might say, towards the outcomes that you want. So thanks again, everybody, for a wonderful session today. Come and visit me at magneticmemorymethod.com and register for that free course. And the new podcast is out. I'd be delighted to see your comments on that podcast. There's the link for you. Give it a listen and uh, hit those share buttons. Leave some comments. And until we have a chance to speak again, let me know what... Uh, what I can do to help with questions and ask questions that are as detailed as you can make them and show what you've done, include memory palace drawings and uh, your, your magnetic imagery so that we can see what you're actually doing. Cause then the answers you get will be surprisingly much more useful than some of the general questions where um, too many details are lacking to even be useful. So thanks again. And until we have a chance to speak again, keep yourself magnetic.